Morning, friends. Welcome to Worship with First United Methodist Church, a church that is on the move for Christ here in Winchester, Frederick County, Virginia. My name is Sean Devilites. I'm the pastor here at First UMC, and we are so glad that you could be part of online worship with us today. A couple of things you should know. First, we're pre-recorded, so you'll see us in different places, sometimes different outfits throughout the service, but it's a cool way for as many different places and as many different people that make up the life of our church to be a part of worship. I think that's great. We're continuing our series called True Story today, and we're hearing from this prophet named Micah about what is true about God's peace. And so we're looking forward to that. And throughout the service, know that you can like, comment, or share, whether you're worshiping with us on Facebook or YouTube. Let us know where you're worshiping from, any prayer requests you might have. I think it's a cool way to see how the Spirit is bringing us all together today. But with that, again, we are so glad that you were here. Let's worship together. O king of the Gentiles and their desired one, cornerstone that makes both one, come and deliver us whom you formed out of the dust of the earth. Sometimes when we're trying something new or when we're facing a difficult decision, when we want to celebrate something or when we just feel alone and lost and uncertain about life, the universe and everything, we long for peace. We don't always think of it that way or word it that way. We say we need advice or support or companions or someone to help us find an answer. But even if we don't find an answer, even if things aren't fixed, we acknowledge the moments in our stories when we finally feel at peace. The prophet Micah spoke of a blessing coming to an unexpected place, an unassuming town, but by God's grace would be the means that God would bless the whole world, the part of the story where God would bring someone forward and he shall be the one of peace. Today, we light these candles, the candles of hope, of peace, of joy, We also light today the candle of love as a sign that we know God's peace and we know waiting for that peace to be felt and lived. We light these candles as a sign that through God's love, we can be people of peace.
Good morning. I am Jo Ellen Smith, and reading our scripture this morning comes from Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5a, regarding the ruler from Bethlehem. But you, O Bethlehem of Ephrathah, who are one of the little clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to rule in Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she who is in labor has brought forth, then the rest of his kindred shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall live secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hey again, friends, if you missed at the beginning, my name is Sean Devilites. I'm the pastor here at First, and today we are continuing our series called True Story. It's our Advent series, as we hear from different prophets in the Bible and how they help tell us what is true about our God. Over the last few weeks, we've explored how God's promises in Jeremiah are true, even when they're in the midst of exile, and how keeping our promises today can give us hope. We heard how God prepares us in the book of Malachi to create space for ourselves and our neighbors to share in God's love. And we see how praising God in Zephaniah reminds us that God brings us into a story that is bigger than any one of us. So today on this fourth and final Sunday of Advent, we hear from this prophet Micah talking about someone of peace. 
God's peace is something that we believe to be true, but we ask ourselves, what does that mean for us? How do we really become truly people of peace? What does it mean when we find ourselves in the midst of conflict? Over those questions today, we get to reflect. Let's pray. God, we are grateful for this morning. We are grateful for each and every time that we have the opportunity to gather, knowing that all of our different stories, all of the good and all of the bad, in this moment are brought together and are considered sacred. God, we ask that you bless this time, that we might sense your peace, and that we might learn more about you, more about ourselves, and more about each other. We love you. Amen. Where is your place of peace? Somewhere that the noise of the world seems a little bit quieter, or your pulse can slow down just a bit, where you can take one or more deep breaths. Place, you know, where things seem okay again. Where is your place of peace? For me, I'm, I'm sitting in it, actually. Uh, I've always loved the way Christmas trees look at night. Uh, there's just something about, maybe it's because it's quiet. Uh, maybe it's because it seems like there's less going on around me. But just sitting around a Christmas tree at night uh, gives me this sense of calm and this sense of peace. And, and these kind of places become increasingly important to us, right? Especially when the rest of our lives become increasingly complicated. Now, I remember loving sitting in front of a Christmas tree as a kid, uh, but even now, uh, having kids of my own, it's funny, you know, just the, those brief moments of quiet that sometimes we don't, we don't always know that we're going to have in the course of the day. Sometimes that's all we need to remember God's peace. But over the past few weeks, we've heard of a couple of different times in the Bible that these people named prophets try to speak out during complicated times, times when communities seemed threatened, where people in power abused their power, that there just seemed to be conflict of all different kinds going around all the time. And so as we think about our places of peace and how our lives have either been maybe somewhat peaceful, but other times they've been in a lot of conflict, and we hold tighter to those places of peace, we hear these prophets speaking to communities that are going through those exact same changes. The prophet we hear from today, Micah, lives in such a time as this. According to scholars, Micah did his prophet thing in the 700s BCE, so 700 years before Jesus. And what was unique about Micah is that his name was actually pretty common. Uh, it, it meant, who is like the Lord? And there's a lot of different prophets that have used that name. But this Micah, thanks to some scholars' work, we know is from rural roots. And the notes of my study Bible add that because of that, he could see firsthand how certain policies put in place by people in political, social, or religious leadership affected those in lower classes. And that's part of why Micah, if you read through his book, is so focused on these words of hope and salvation, even in addition to the usual prophetic judgment and lament, right? He wanted to preach truth to expose injustice and inequity, especially by leaders of either social, political, or, or religious capacity that were somehow trading their responsibilities to care for others in order to make a profit of some kind, a, a different kind of profit, if you will, the profit with an F. Uh, salvation, then, was a sense that this injustice would end, and instead justice would prevail. Those who were affected by unjust policies could maintain hope that things would get better in their communities and not just stay the same. And one day, there would be peace. In our passage, Micah tells of this salvation being something that would truly come from the least known parts of Judah. And real quick, Judah is the southern part of Israel that broke away after the death of King Solomon. And so it's... Uh, it's kind of a surprise to think that the person's going to come from a lesser known part of that part of what was God's kingdom. And we hear in verse four to five of our passage, he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord in the majesty of the name of the Lord, his God, and they shall live secure for now. He shall be great to the ends of the earth and he shall be the one of peace. 
Some other translations say, and thus shall be the peace. And, and that's, that's a word for a community that has known nothing but conflict for hundreds of years. This is a community where leaders have scrambled to make alliances with different, different regional powers to try to stave off other regional powers. And they, they want to maintain sovereignty and control. And in the midst of that, there's a cost usually to the everyday person. So this has been the norm for, for a long time. And, and there are people in this land that still struggle to remember how it's true that they're actually God's people still when it seems like everything in the world is so scary, so uncertain, and just so fraught with risk. Many today would hear this passage and would hear about Jesus being that one of peace, by the way, which is probably good because I think some of us can resonate with that idea of living in a tumultuous, a busy, a scary time. This should remind that in God's story, seeking something that is true and important for us to find is this peace of God. It is important for us to know that God seeks that peace too. And not just an absence of conflict, but a presence of this thing called peace. Because if we're being honest, you know, we, we hear in Scripture all the time about how there's different conflicts going on. And I think you and I know pretty well that we're probably not going to live in a time where there isn't some form of conflict. Conflict comes up in relationships. It's how we handle and live into that conflict. And you can either do that well or not well. And typically a lot of us know stories of when we haven't done it well, right? So it's not just trying to avoid conflicts. That has its own consequences. It's looking for this thing called peace. These places, you know, that we thought about just a few moments ago are places of peace where we just know for at least a moment, that things are okay. And perhaps in some way, those moments feel like escape, depending on how our lives are going and how crazy they might seem. But really, we, we understand that we need, as people, some kind of safe space, some kind of shelter. That's why churches have sanctuaries. That's why we refer to God being our shelter, a place where we can come to know that there is this God, this God who desires peace and will make that peace happen. And this God that has been at work doing that work for thousands of years. All of that, and that God loves us. How cool is that, right? That, that, how do, so how do we live into that peace that God has intended for us to be in? So if we're being honest, even our greatest places of peace can sometimes lose their luster. You know, there's just sometimes there's just so much going on, there's just so much that seems to be falling down around us, that the lights in the tree just don't seem to glimmer the same way anymore. That, you know, that we don't feel the presence of God and the core of our being the same way anymore. Amid threats of violence in schools and communities, tornadoes that cross over several states, uncertainty in our national and international leadership, this is pandemic that just doesn't stop and the seemingly encouraged amount of bickering and fighting, how can things be okay again? When will we truly experience the peace? As someone who currently is struggling to sense that peace myself, I'm reminded that the season of Advent with all the waiting that we do, we have the opportunity to practice some things. And it's funny because there's a lot in our world that our work, our school activities, hobbies, jobs, sports, whatever, that we're encouraged to practice things. But sometimes we forget that we can also practice things with our faith. And one of those things we practice is our willingness to hold two things as true together at the same time. One of those things that's true is that the world today needs some help probably fair to say that, right? But the second is that this story of a God that seeks justice, that delivers salvation, that will deliver peace, that story is true too. And so as God's people were tasked with being people of peace in the first place. There's other parts of Micah where you, can, where you hear things that might sound familiar, like, like turning plows in, into, turn, blah, 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 blah. cut that part out. 
there's other parts of Micah where we hear these different illustrations of how we are to, to beat swords into plowshares, to turn things that are weapons into tools that we can use to support communities, that, that God's peace is so different from the one that many of us might have come to know. And so for us as people, how we practice peace might just be different than anything we've done before. And it's not that we're always at peace, that we're always willing to practice it. So when we see the world, how do we move it out of our headspace into our heart space? That's a question I first heard from the theologian Richard Rohr. How do we use compassion in all these things that we think through in the world? Because we do a lot of thinking. We do a lot of processing. We do a lot of reading. We do a lot of intaking information. But sometimes we can get so caught up in what's up here that we don't share it with what's right here our compassion, our love. And man, that's a hard thing to do because it, it's easier to, to keep things in a, in a headspace, right? It's, it's this idea, it's this thought. As soon as we move it to our heart, it affects us differently. It calls into us this sense of empathy. We hurt, we feel things. We share those feelings with someone else. So how does that kind of heart space, that kind of vulnerability become part of our faith life? How does it become part of our prayer life? What comes up in our prayers often? What doesn't come up? How often do we pray? And, and I ask that. I, I think sometimes when we hear that question, we, we feel bad about the amount or think we should be more. Just be at peace with it, right? How often are we praying right now? And when we think about those conversations with God, what about our conversations with others? What is it that we find ourselves talking about the most. What in our faith is motivating those conversations? And how do we see the person that's across from us? Whether it's in person, whether it's at the dinner table, whether it's in a store, whether it's over Zoom or some other social media application, whether we can see their face or not. How do we see people and where do we hold them? Where do we hold them? It's in these initial moments of peace that we have the opportunity to see our role in bringing about this larger peace. What Micah preached to people all those years ago was that changing how we lead our own lives and how we lead our lives together has the potential to put the community in a better path. That potential remains for us today. And it's true because it's the path that God intended for us to be on. So in this week, Hearing this true part of who God is, this sense of peace, where we are so close to celebrating the way that Christ broke into the world and changed it, but remember what it was like to not quite be there yet. And we remember the ways that God has already broken into our world. You know, God has already changed it. That God is the one who sits with us in each and every one of our peaceful places. That God is also the one that goes with us who will work until the world becomes that peaceful place. And until then, may we be a piece of God's peace ourselves. Let's pray. God, in the words of a familiar hymn, you are a God that truly teaches us to love one another. Your law is love and your gospel is peace. Change shall you break for the slave is our sibling and in your name all oppression shall cease. That is the kind of peace that we know you are about, God. And that's the kind of peace we share in when we join together in prayer. So from all the different places that we're in today, we come together and lift up the leaders of our community, state, nation, and world. We pray for all those affected by COVID-19. We pray for first responders, for all those serving in roles, providing care for others, for all those who teach and who learn, whether they have a degree to show for it or not. We pray that we have the courage to be hospitable towards others, to be an anti-racist people until racism is gone from this world. We pray for those affected by disaster, both natural and man-made. 
We especially pray for those affected by the tornadoes in Arkansas and Illinois, Kentucky, Missouri, Mississippi, and Tennessee. We lift up those who use their voice to amplify the voice of others who are oppressed. And we lift up all those serving away from home, those without homes, and all those who could not be with us today. We commit ourselves to resisting evil, injustice, and oppression in whatever forms they present themselves. And God, we long for and pray for your peace. We lift up Bob, Brian, Cheryl, Gary, Jeff, John, Joy, Kim, and others on our church prayer list. And pause and I lift up others on our hearts and minds as well. God, is for all these people, each and every one of these persons that we give thanks to you and ask that you continue to reveal yourself to them and to us in the ways that we just do not understand. God, we also ask that you empower us, that you equip us, that you transform us, that we might find ways to share your peace in ways that we do understand. With that, we join together in the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, at this point in our service, we get to worship together with our offering. And there's a couple different ways you can share your offering with us here at First UMC. You can give online by going to our website and going to our giving page. Uh, you can also mail your offering in to the address listed below or bring it to an in-person gathering at church. Uh, but know that your offering is something that, that contributes to the everyday work of our church. All the things that go on during the day, I've mentioned it before, I'm spoiled. I get to see a lot of it. Uh, the way we are able to see people's lives get changed because they come to know this God of peace, this God that loves them. That's something you get to help make happen through what we do right now in our offering. And so know that, you know, that whether it's your first time or second time or you've never given before or you've been giving for a long time, we're grateful for the, what you do share with us. We're grateful for your time and your prayers and your presence and all the ways that you live into being God's people. Also, we'll lift up to you, in addition to that general offering that we have at the church, we're also doing a special Christmas offering. And you may remember this from Thanksgiving. This Christmas offering is going to go to United Methodist Family Services. Uh, United Methodist Family Services, or UMFS, is a nonprofit organization that provides a comprehensive array of programs to meet the needs of high risk children and parents to enable them to overcome challenging circumstances and succeed. They do really good, awesome work. And so we're excited to be able to support them as First UMC and give this Christmas offering to them. So now if you'd like to be a part of that offering specifically, whether you give online or, or in your mail or, ha or in person, just note that you want it to go towards our Christmas offering, uh, or you can just have your gift go to our general offering at this time. Either one's going to make an impact in someone's life. And so we're grateful for that. We're grateful for you. And we're going to pause and pray over our offerings as we hear a musical offering.
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, forgive us for the times our faith falters and fails, or when foolish thoughts fluctuate in our minds, causing unfounded doubts and fears within us. As we return the portion of our earnings that belong to you, we also thank you that in your grace you have given us peace. Amen. Friends, this concludes our worship service this morning, and we are so grateful that you came to share this time with us online. There's a couple things I want you to know, uh, especially what's coming up this weekend for us at First UMC. Uh, we're going to be having three services on Christmas Eve. That is Friday. Uh, we're going to have a 3 o'clock family service. We're going to have glow sticks instead of candles. There's going to be some activities for the kids to do. That's going to be in person on our Apple Pie Ridge campus. We're also going to have a 5 o'clock service that is fairly traditional. It'll have candles and carols. The carols at 3 o'clock too, uh, but I guess the format of, this, of the service will be a sermon at 5 o'clock. Uh, will be one that you might have been to before. And then at 8 o'clock, we'll have our online service together. Um, that also means that Sunday, the 26th, we're going to have online-only worship. Uh, so we'll all gather together Sunday morning at 11 at our usual time online. Uh, but with all of that, know that any changes that might be coming this week, uh, there's you know a lot of news going on about how we can keep people safe and keep people healthy. We'll make sure you are up to date with all that information as well so we can do everything we can to love our neighbors. With that, now we get to go. Go knowing that you get to be a part of sharing God's peace today and every day. And go in the name of God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.